Welcome to Lessons Leadership. I am Steve Adubato, and as always, my colleague, co-anchor and executive producer, Mary Gamba is there. Mary, how are you doing? I'm doing great. I always love to hear all the different titles that I get every time that we do the show. They're slightly different. So I'm waiting for chief operating officer, uh, CEO, president. Just keep them coming. Hey, Mary, uh, let's let everyone know, A, where they can see us, and B, who underwrites the program. Sure thing. So uh, first of all, you can follow Steve on Facebook at Steve Adubato, PhD. That's A-D-U-B-A-T-O, as well as on Twitter at Steve Adubato. You can find our program on Google Play, as well as Apple Podcasts. You can always log on to our website at stand-deliver.com. What about News 12 Plus? Uh, oh, yeah. Well, News 12 Plus, hopefully you're watching us there right now. It's Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Uh, on News 12 Plus. And uh, I'd also like to thank all of our sponsors that make this possible. Uh, we've got Gibbons, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers. And we got and a new one. We have a brand new one, the Down Strategic Leadership Institute. Thank you, Larry Downs. Uh, all right, we don't just plug the entire time on Lessons in Leadership. And this gentleman would appreciate it as a master of marketing, communication, and branding. He is Michael Connect. Our good friend Michael Connect is a Senior Vice President of Strategic Marketing and Communications, the great RWJ Barnabas Health. Good to see you, Michael. Great to see you, Steve and Mary. Uh, Michael, fair to say you and I have been talking about leadership communication, particularly under challenging, difficult situations for well over a decade. Uh, I think it, well over a decade, yes. Yes, I think we, we, we shouldn't do the math anymore at our age, uh, Steve, but no, it's, it's been a great partnership. And, and, and along those lines, Michael, as it relates to COVID-19, again, RWJ Barnabas Health in the middle of this, your colleagues at Rutgers University, many of your colleagues, the leaders there involved, uh, including Dr. Brian Strom, who was talking about their role as well in this whole pandemic. Question, biggest challenge for you as a leader within the system, a very large system, the, uh, by the way, the RWJ Barnabas Health system, describe it, how many hospitals? We have 13 hospitals. We are New Jersey's largest academic health system. So 13 acute and, and post-acute hospitals, a number of ambulatory locations, medical groups, uh, and uh, we stretch from Southern to Northern New Jersey. So the number one leadership and communication challenge you and your position have faced since say mid-March, we're taping this in later end of the summer, mm -hmm. has been what? I think the, the, the fluid nature of the pandemic has been our biggest challenge. The fact that uh, we have been learning as a hotspot uh, provider, same as uh, New York hospitals, the fact that the, uh, the treatments have been changing, the availability of supplies you know, has been so fluid, um, the guidelines from the CDC have been changing. So as communicators, you know, we've really tried to continue to keep the lines of communication open with our staff, with our physicians, with our communities, but the rules of engagement have been changing. Uh, we've learned dramatically uh, how to take care of our patients much more effectively. Um, and we've seen that evolve over time since our first patients. Uh, at, at this taping, we now have less than 100 patients currently mm -hmm. in-house at any of one of our facilities, agreed. At our height, we had 1,800 patients uh, you know, in, our, in our facility. So you know, thankfully, the work of the state, the governor, the commissioner of health, and our leadership, you know, we've kept those counts down. Um, but the, the situation is so fluid, and the challenges on communication are just evident as a result of that fluid nature. You know, Michael, we, uh, if people should go on our website, stand-deliver.com, to see our previous interviews. One of the more interesting ones we did was with Barry Ostrowski, the CEO of the system, um, RWJ Barnabas Health. And we talked a lot about what he's learned through this, and he continues to learn. But here's what I'm curious about. Coaching mentoring, a big part of what we do, and you know that well, we've talked about it for years. How hard is it to get some of your leaders within the system to speak more effectively, both internally and externally, when words are being measured, intent, everything, intonation, all of it, how hard is it? There's a question here, I promise. How the heck do you get people who've been trained to operate, get things done with that COO mentality? Mm -hmm. Now you have to be more CEO oriented, leadership, external and internal on the communication and how do you get them ready for that? Well, it's really, I think a lot of it distills and, and boils down to trust. And, and I think that the, the tools that we can give them as communications professionals, um, you know, are, are just that, tools. But having a leader who, who has already built a reservoir of trust with the audiences that he or she is communicating with 
to me is of paramount importance. And you can't fake that. You can't sell that. You have to have that and it's got to be part of who you are and you have to have that connection with your, with your audience. And by audience, I mean your staff, your physicians, your community, elected leaders, particularly in times of crisis that, that we're currently in, you can't start building that relationship uh, that yields effective communication now. You've got to be building that up well over time. So I've been very fortunate, as you know, uh, to have worked with, with and for many great leaders who understand the value of trust and the power that comes uh, with trust and communication. Uh, certainly, you mentioned Barry Ostrowski currently, uh, Steve Jones at Robert Wood Johnson, uh, my colleagues, Micheline Davis, Amy Mansu. Again, I've been very fortunate to, to work with some solid communicators, exceptional communicators, but they never lost sight of the fact that those conversations are all about one-on-one -on -one and building a relationship with the audience. So really, that's the piece that we can help groom leaders and future leaders to be more effective and clear. But without that kernel of trust you know, with the audience, nothing that we do as communications professionals is going to make them you know, take their message over the goal line, really. Well said, Mary, jump in. With so much uncertainty, Michael, especially with the, uh, with the coronavirus, uh, dealing with communicating, getting out information, how do you balance getting out that information, which you literally have to say, we don't know everything, and you don't want to create a panic, but you do want to give just enough information. How do you manage the delicate balancing act of, all right, how much are you communicating when, to whom, and just really helping to, as you said, build that trust with the internal and external stakeholders. That's a great question, Mary. And it's something that certainly we've faced daily and hourly here at RWJ Barnabas Health during the pandemic. I think the short answer is, you know, it's never enough, it's never often enough, and it's never clear enough. And I think that's one of the things that we as communicators, particularly in tough situations and crises, have got to remember. That the messages, has, messages have got to remain very clear and concise uh, the audiences that we were trying to reach during the pandemic were being bombarded with messages, internal, external. They're taking care of patients. They're trying to support families. And when, when they're looking for the updates from leadership, whether that's from the corporate level uh, that, that we support or our local leaders at our facilities, that clarity, that, that, that linear approach to give me what I need to know when I need to know it so I can do my job and then stay out of my way, that's the, that's the relationship that we've, we've tried to perfect and achieve uh, with our communications during this pandemic. I think the other unspoken or unuttered uh, component around communication is just listening. You know, and I'm a huge proponent that you know, the most effective communicators are the ones who listen most effectively. Um, and so we needed to make sure that we were listening to what our audiences needed, whether they're internal or external, whether it's engaging the public, uh, or making sure that our staff know that we're, we're doing you know, our utmost to provide them with PPE or the latest drug protocols. We need to listen to what they're asking us and make sure our messages deliver on that first and foremost. One more quick follow-up on this, Michael. Uh, you and I have had many offline conversations about the role of the media. And to disclose, as people know, I've been, I'm a broadcaster. I've been a broadcaster for a long time. But I also, through our company, Stand and Deliver, that produces this program, done a lot of um, executive coaching around communication and media. And when there's someone I'm interviewing, I will always disclose that, um, that I've coached in the past. But here's my point. There are an awful lot of executives and leaders that I've come across who really don't want to deal with the media, particularly in a time of crisis. They just don't. They'd rather not. It's not really their choice, is it, Michael? It isn't. It isn't. I, I think it comes with the territory. Um, I think that we are fortunate with uh, the size and scope of our health system, that we have the ability to find the right leader and content, content expert to address a question at hand. And so while a CEO or a COO uh, or a chief medical officer uh, may not, by nature of their role, um, be able to opt out you know, or take a pass you know, for some of the tough questions in the interviews, you know, we do have the comfort of having uh, technical experts, clinical experts, research leaders, as you mentioned, you know, our partners with at Rutgers have a, 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 a rich you know, uh, array of, of experts, you know, in mo most of the disciplines that we could ever need to address from a clinical standpoint. So we have the resources, we have the bench, and I think that's the, that's the piece that gives our leaders comfort, mm -hmm. that they know that we're going to support them 
to give the messages around leadership um, and management, but we have the clinical leaders to back them up uh, to, to talk about the things that, that they don't need to feel proficient at. Got about a minute left. By the way, stay tuned because after Michael Connect, we have Lieutenant Governor Sheila Oliver talking about leadership and her unique perspective and experience around leadership. Mary, got 30 seconds, go. Sure, and uh, Michael, one important thing is uh, we all talk about the importance of a team and getting a team to really buy in and, and to just believe in the mission, the, the, value, the value of the organization and the vision. Uh, what advice do you have for building a good team? Well, I always like to find people who are different than me to, to, to build the diversity of my team. I have a, a fabulous team here at RWJ Barnabas Health and you know, thank goodness they're not all like me. Uh, you know, I think we complement each other well. We all bring different skill sets. We have different ages. We have different ethnicities, uh, educational backgrounds, and that's what builds, particularly in communications. You know, because my team matches the diversity of our state, and that that to me helps build uh, a, a better marketing campaign, a better communications mm -hmm. campaign, um, because we understand, you know, I think better who we're trying to reach. So, in building a team, I look for folks that complement what I think I bring to the table. Um, and then, but still bring the passion and the enthusiasm that I hope I convey as the leader of our team. Uh, Michael Connex, uh, Senior Vice President, Strategic Marketing Communications, RWJ Barnabas Health. And let me disclose that uh, RWJ Barnabas Health has been a long time supporter of what we do in public broadcasting. And I've done a significant amount of communication coaching there over the last few years. Um, Michael, thank you so much for joining us and sharing with our audience. Steve, Mary, thank you for having me. Really appreciate the opportunity. This is Lessons in Leadership, and we'll be right, by, right back. I'll get that out. Welcome back. This is Steve Adubato with my colleague, Mary Gamma. Mary, uh, before we introduce Lieutenant Governor uh, of the great state of New Jersey, uh, Sheila Oliver, who was absolutely fabulous talking about leadership and talking about how she's evolved as a leader and as a former Speaker of the House in New Jersey, Speaker of the Assembly, Lieutenant Governor, now um, dealing in a male-dominated government and political world as an African-American woman. Talk about leadership qualities. We'll talk about her in a second, but what was your biggest takeaway from Michael Connect? Michael shared the importance of knowing who your key stakeholders are, mm -hmm. sharing enough information uh, very often, especially when things are changing by the minute, by the day. And that is so important in leadership and communication. And that was the biggest takeaway that I had from his segment. The other thing about Michael is, remember, he's coaching and helping people internally who, who communicate externally and internally on behalf of his organization. And the connection between being an excellent, competent, effective communicator and being a leader is indisputable. You can't be a great leader without doing that other part. So when people say things like, I just want to get things done, but I don't like to speak in front of other people, you're laughing because, Mary? Well, because he, that is so true, and, and I just laugh because we talk about that all the time. And I also loved how Michael shared the importance of having a really great and diverse team uh, to support and round out, and that really helps to make an organization that much stronger. And talking about growing as a leader and getting better, that is the case with Sheila Oliver, the Lieutenant Governor of New Jersey, who I've known for many years. She gives her a very unique and important perspective on what it takes to be a great leader and how she has evolved as a leader, Sheila Oliver. We're honored to be joined by the Lieutenant Governor of the great state of New Jersey, Sheila Oliver. Um, Sheila, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Lieutenant Governor, let me ask you this. We did a previous conversation for public broadcasting on um, where we are post-COVID, or not, I shouldn't say post-COVID, in the midst of COVID, but help us on this. We're taping this in mid-June. The disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on people, on black and brown people, what is that about? I think it's a number of things. And of course, we've been examining this uh, you know, with our Department of Health and experts that have been working with us. Um, for one thing, um, many people in the Black community already had pre-existing conditions, diabetes, heart disease, a um, number of different underlying conditions access to health care, even though we've kind of gotten the ACA in place where people can, you know, go in a health exchange and, and get low cost uh, health insurance, many people don't even have that. So what you find in the African American community for people who are not insured, 
they don't visit doctors regularly, so they don't know what condition they are in. We've learned that this virus um, can, if you have a compromised system, if you have any of these underlying conditions, uh, COVID's gonna come right in as a welcome visitor. And I think that is the top reason. The second, and you know, one of our dear friends uh, shared this with me, Janine LaRue. She called me up one day. She's the best, absolutely the best. And she hey, said- By the way, check out uh, Janine LaRue, her Facebook, Regular posts are absolutely terrific. Just check that out. I'm sorry that I shouldn't have plugged, but she's our friend. Go ahead. But Janine said to me one day, Sheila, do you realize that people who live uh, in the Trenton Housing Authority properties, um, it's no more than 600 square feet. And there may be a mother, there may be three children, there may be two, two uh, grandchildren. But Janine and I engaged in a conversation that um, in low and moderate income families, they generally are living in cramped quarters. And that is why we were all concerned if there were adult children in a household who were going in and out, going to work, continuing to work, and coming home to that elderly grandmother. But I think that our living situations um, are, are contribute to the spread of the COVID as well. Uh, Lieutenant Governor, let me ask you this. Um, in our previous conversation, we talked a little bit about institutional racism, racism, confronting it. But this is a different twist on it. Why do you think it is so difficult for so many? Listen, listen Sheila Oliver is from Essex County. I'm from Essex County. We're from neighboring towns. We've known each other for a long time. Let's just say this. I'm not going to stereotype, but I'll do the best I can in describing this. There are some folks in certain parts of Essex County, disproportionately white, middle-class, upper-middle-class, who, who are my friends, who are your friends, mm -hmm. who, let's just say, are not as sensitive and, 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 let, and not as um, willing to look at their own contribution to racism or their own racist feelings. All of us struggle with that. But here's the question. For some of them, I find it and I imagine you would find it particularly difficult to talk honestly about race, race relations, racism. Mm -hmm. Because there are many who say, trust me, there's a question here. We already quote dealt with that. But then you see George Floyd, you see so many cases after that. The question is this, is it as hard to talk honestly about racism as it appears to me to be? Uh, absolutely, Steve, it is a difficult conversation and you know, being an African American, I think we need to have uh, honest conversations amongst ourselves because we are racist too. What do you mean by that? That African Americans also hold stereotypical view of Caucasians, of Asians, of uh, people that come from African nations, people that come from Caribbean nations. Um, I think racism is broader than just black versus white in the United States. And I attribute it all to lack of experience. So yes, I, I, I like you, Essex County, I have friends in, in you know, the Western part of the county, but they know me, I know them, I've had history with them, I've worked with them. And I think what the issue gets to be, we continue to have such segregated communities in our state, but it has to do with the unequal distribution of wealth. That's really what it has to do with. You know, when, when the Lieutenant Governor talks about segregated communities, communities, it's interesting. Essex County is an incredibly diverse county, but people are segregated. I happen to live in Montclair, born and raised in Newark, New Jersey. Montclair is a relatively integrated community, yes. but there are pockets of segregation. Yes. Essex County is a diverse county, but African Americans disproportionately live in Newark, East Orange, Arv uh, Irvington, uh, et cetera. We're sep we don't know each other's experiences. That's correct. Is that part of the reason why it's so hard? It is. And then, Steve, when you think about young people, when they're socialized and you know they're going through development, they're in segregated schools. And you know, when I was running the leaguers in Newark, uh, a youth a great not-for-profit organization committed to education. And, and promoting leadership among young people. Yes, but one of the things I made it a point of was giving 
experiences, travel experiences within the state and outside of the state to introduce kids that were living in Newark and East Orange and Irvington the opportunity to see a different hmm. kind of life, a different kind of community. There are many urban kids growing up in urban school systems. They've never been to Monmouth County or Ocean County or Salem County, Cumberland. And I think that this creates the divide. As a legislator, I found that to be true because our, our state legislature is built up around regionalism. And when I was a, the speaker, I made a commitment to travel. Speaker of the assembly. Yes. I made it my business to travel to all 40 districts, legislative districts. And I got a real education. It made me a better legislator um, mm. because I understood that Salem County is mm. probably the poorest to be found. Everybody thinks it's Newark. Everyone thinks it's Trenton or, you know, it's Camden, Camden at the time. But uh, poverty exists in other parts of the state. I always say the Raritan River is the great divide in New Jersey. Mm. If you live above it, you know one New Jersey. If you lo live below it, you know another. Final and question. I think that, that contributes to this whole issue of racism. Sorry for interrupting. Final question. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Oliver was, the, uh, was one of the many honorees. Each year, we run a, um, a not-for-profit entity called Stand and Deliver for young men and women uh, in urban areas, disproportionately in Newark, teaching communication leadership skills. It's run by uh, our great leader, Mary Gamba, uh, on our team. And, and every year, the Dr. Martin Luther King Award <clears throat> isn't given, it is earned by someone. And Lieutenant Governor um, was a Dr. King honoree in front of about 400 young people who are at this event. And it causes me to ask this question, since that program is all about leadership. Your philosophy of leading, your paradigm, if you will, of leading, your approach to leading is modeled and shaped by what? The many mentors that I had uh, during my teen years, and uh, I'll start with my family because my family was, a, was a, you know, now they have hashtag stay woke. Uh, my parents were woke. And so at an early age, um, we had an extended family that was made up of all kinds of people. Uh, my mother's best friend was a Jewish woman from Sheepshead Bay, New York. Um, so I think that the things that I ideologically adopted at an early age contributed to leadership. I also think that um, I'm a baby boomer and um, I think I developed early a strong work ethic. We often think that young people today don't have a strong work ethic, but I think a strong work ethic contributes to your ability to be a, a good youth leader. And ironically, Mary Birch, who um, oh. was the founder of the leaguers. Of the leaguers, right. She gave me a lesson in 1980 that I have never forgotten. She said to me, Sheila, if you are going to embark on a life of public service, then you must develop an alligator hide. I have never forgotten that. And I developed an alligator hide. The other thing that's important to be a good leader is something I had on a t-shirt uh, from a conference I went to. And it said, leadership is the only ship that doesn't return to port when there's a storm. So translate that's that. Translate that for us, Lieutenant Governor. The leadership is the only ship that does not re return, return to port when there's a storm. And that says what to you? It says to me that um, no matter what is going on on a given day, no matter what obstacles and challenges might be represented, you just persevere and you work through it. It creates a better um, leader in you. And uh, the other thing I think that I learned in a, as a leadership um, characteristic, and I learned this from another person you and I know, Alex Plinio, who was at Prudential. Prudential for many years. Mm -hmm. Alex taught me the concept that win-lose 
is not a good paradigm. Win-win is a good paradigm. So as in the leadership roles I have had to fulfill, I have often stressed working towards win-win, that everyone walks away from the table with something. Might not be with 100% of what they want, but everyone gains something. And uh, I think these are the things that contribute to someone being a good leader. Uh, on a final note, the other thing you did not mention, <clears throat> Sheila Oliver, is that every day I've known you for 20, 30 years, you've shown people nothing but respect, no matter who they are, where they are, and what their title is or is not. So the just respecting other people and their humanity is part of leadership as well. You honor us by your presence, by your leadership, and by your dedication to the state of New Jersey, its citizens, particularly those who are most vulnerable. Um, Lieutenant Governor Sheila Oliver, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate always seeing you. Fascinating conversation with the Lieutenant Governor of New Jersey, Sheila Oliver. Mary, you know what struck me about Lieutenant Governor? Again, we've known her for many years. She actually received the Dr. Martin Luther King Leadership Award in our not-for-profit Stand and Deliver program for inner city youth. That was important and meaningful, wasn't it? It sure was. Just having the students um, who really look up to, and again, you talk about um, just a powerful woman who is so well-spoken and really just is, she demonstrates fully what the traits of a great leader and communicator truly are. So she was a perfect role model for those students. You know what the Lieutenant Governor also said in that interview is that she learned about leadership and was shaped by her mentors during her teen years, her family, extended family. So here's the thing that's interesting to me. You and I were talking as we prepped for the show yesterday, and I said, one of the things I want to cover is how much can you really teach our own children to be leaders, or do they just have to learn from their mistakes? I don't think they have to just, I think it's a combination of both. I think you need to teach them to be responsible, and then that will help them to, be, to become really good leaders. And yes, you do need to let them make their own mistakes sometimes, because if you're always there to fix their problems, they're never going to truly learn those tips and tools that work for them. Yeah. There's not a one size fits all approach to parenting, nor is there one for leadership. So it is very important that we as parents guide our children to become responsible uh, young adults and then eventually uh, really great leaders. It's interesting. One of the things I just took from what you just said is, as parents, one of the ways we can help our children to be the best leaders and people they can be is to let them fail. Yes. And that's hard for some of us, and I'll include myself. If I think one of our kids is about to fail or has failed, my first instinct is to rescue. Yes. And that's fine from about zero to 10 years old. I think you need to be there to support. <laughs> you need to be there to nurture. And from 10, you know, 10, 11 onward, whether it's a homework assignment that's missed, whether it's a deadline that they missed, whether it's a bad decision that they made in life or with friends or with family, you need to let them fail and deal with their own consequences. Give them the tools. Uh, and it's the same with your employees. If your employees make a mistake, you can recommend what they do to fix the problem. But if you're always there to clean up their mess, they're never going to learn. And then they're never going to be able, you're not always going to be there to fix their problems. And that's the most important message for any parent out there and any leader out there, really, uh, just helping your team to grow. Well said. By the way, Mary, before I let everyone go, let everyone know, other than News 12 Plus, where they can find lessons in leadership. Sure. So you could subscribe to our podcast so you can listen on the road on Google Play, um, also on Apple Podcasts. And obviously, as you said, we're on News 12 Plus. We're also on Spotify. And you can also go right to our website at stand-deliver.com, where we have all of our past episodes in mm -hmm. audio and video. You can click on them and uh, everything is right there. One quick thank you, uh, final thank you to our sponsors. Sure. Uh, we have wonderful sponsors who support and believe in what we do. We couldn't do this without them. It's Gibbons PC, Prager Metis. We have the International Union of Operating Engineers, Valley Bank, and our newest funder, the Downs Strategic Leadership Institute. You always have to thank the people who brung you to the dance. I'm Steve Adubato. That's Mary Gamba. I want to thank you for watching Lessons in Leadership. See you next time. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. This edition of Lessons in Leadership is brought to you by Gibbons PC, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, 
then the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825.